I know I've already said this and uh, on the screens, but I want to say it again. Merry Christmas, and we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, if you're a guest, I, I want to just quickly introduce myself. I'm Jeff Hawkins. I'm the uh, associate and outreach minister here at the church, and uh, I just want to say that we're so thankful that you have chosen uh, to, to celebrate your Christmas season in this way. You've chosen this morning uh, to be with us, to focus your thoughts uh, on the real reason for Christmas, and uh, you know, you're welcome here anytime, uh, but we're especially thankful that you've, you've chosen to make this service and this reminder of Jesus uh, to be a part of your, Christmas, uh, your family's Christmas celebrations. Well, it's easy to do sometimes. It's, it's so easy to do, even in the, this major difference of this, of this year with, with all that you have going on. And maybe the, the real reality of this 2020 year Christmas is that it's, it's what you don't have going on this year instead of what you normally do. But even in this, it's easy to... Uh, to, to miss out to, with all of the, the craziness and all of the hustle and bustle. And even though it's very, very different this year, it's still here. The, the busyness is still here. Uh, whatever preparations that you're making for you and your family this week, we, we want to we make sure that they're done and we want to make sure that they're done perfectly so that, um, so that we, we accentuate this Christmas season. But sometimes... And trying to make sure that we don't forget the smallest detail, it's really easy to miss out on the most important detail. And that's true even here. Would you believe that even in ministry, that even among church staff, that, that we can do this same thing too? We, we've added new staff to our team this year, which means there are more people now preparing and getting ready to, uh, uh, with the, the video recording, with the, the video production, uh, to, uh, to just uh, have this incredible uh, Christmas Eve online service with you. And we're, we're making these preparations and decorations to, to receive you uh, at the Christmas Eve drive through as you, as you come to get your, your communion supplies and all of the things that will, will help to make this Christmas Eve online service even better. A group of people that are so focused on getting other people to stop for just a while and focus on the baby Jesus in the manger that we sometimes make things so complex and so busy that instead we distract the focus away from the silence and away from the sincerity and away from the childlike simplicity of nativity. It's one of the things I'm really excited for uh, you to be a part of here this morning. You can see these instruments, and somebody asked me in the first service about my noisemakers, and they said, no, no, they're not my noisemakers, but I'm excited for you to hear the noise. Uh, the children are going to be coming to share with us a little bit of our Christmas story this morning. And, and uh, But with all of this, and even as Christians, not even thinking about church staff and church preparations and all that stuff, but just as Christians, for us to uh, try to make Christmas so Christ-centered, it would be a terrible tragedy, wouldn't it, if we would leave out the one reason that we even get to share this week's celebration. We cannot miss out. On Jesus. In 1925, a man named uh, G.K. Chesterton, he wrote a book called The Everlasting Man. And in this book, he writes these words, right in the middle of these things stands up an enormous exception. It's quite unlike anything else. It's a thing final like the trumpet of doom, although it also is a piece of good news. It was good news that seemed too good to be true. It is nothing less than the loud assertion that this mysterious maker of the world has visited his world in person. And that's what we're celebrating. We're we're celebrating the enormous exception. We're celebrating this grand event, the grand miracle. We're celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with skin on, God in the flesh. The last few verses of our scripture this morning says, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied him in a manger because there was no room for them or no place for them in the end. There was no place for them 
in the end. In other words, no one was waiting for them. No, no one was expecting them. And as many times as I've heard that scripture uh, at Christmas time, it, this seems so odd to me because it wasn't like they were, they were strangers in this, in this group of people. They, they were there for the, for the sole purpose of the whole uh, line and house of, of David thing. They, were, they, they would have had relation living in Bethlehem. Not, not, not even to mention that there would have been family that would have been on this same pilgrimage with them to Bethlehem for the census. But there was no room for them in the end. There was nobody at the end, or this, there was nobody at this place of rest that had prepared room for them. But instead, Mary and Joseph and the baby were put at the edge. Mary and Joseph, Jesus' is birth was moved to the outskirts of Bethlehem, the margin. And fortunately for them, there was room at least near the end. And we all know this story, the edge. The edge was good enough. And not only was the edge good enough, the edge was exactly the way that it was meant to be. And it turned out great for the shepherds, too. I was thinking about this this week. You know, that would, this would have been a terrible thing for the shepherds and all their sheep to show up to room 116 at this inn in Bethlehem, you know? So it was great for them that God knew what he was doing. There was no mistake that was happening here in, Jerusalem, in, in Bethlehem. And not only did God know what was happening in Bethlehem then, but he did know See, this wasn't about Caesar Augustus and, and this decree or this census. Uh, it, it was not at all about Quirinius being the governor of Syria. Th those details were minute compared to what was getting ready to happen. I, I think Caesar Augustus and Quirinius, the governor of Syria, were timestamps. I, I think Luke mentions them in this passage just so we have this time reference when we look back at history. That's all they were. See, God knew what he was doing with all of that. He knew what he was doing that year in Bethlehem, but he also knew what he was doing hundreds of years before in Bethlehem when a, a woman named Ruth met a man named Boaz out in the fields of Bethlehem. You see, God had a plan, and the manger, the stable, the outskirts, that was no deviation from the plan. All of those things, the edge, the outskirts, the margin, was absolutely not God's plan B. It was his plan all along. But the inn wasn't ready. And Bethlehem wasn't ready. And, and you can also see in Matthew's account, J Jerusalem wasn't ready. Herod was the king. But they weren't ready. This was a surprise to everyone except for God. And it all takes place on the edge where everything happens by surprise. Well, the good news that happened on that day was such good news. And it turns out to be so true and it turns out to be so powerful that it does very, very well out on the margins. And it wasn't just Mary and Joseph that began their journey with the Son of God, born in a stable and laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You see, they began their journey of our Savior uh, at the edge. But so did the early Christians. The early Christians lived at the edge of the Roman society. Paul makes a, a clear point in his, in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards when you were called. And not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to nullify. That's what the, the NIV says, to nullify the things that are, to make nothing of the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We know that Paul had great success preaching to the outskirts. We, we know that he had great success preaching to, in the margins. If you look at the, the last chapter in Romans, Romans chapter 16, Paul gives personal greeting to 37 different people. 
And researchers have shown that one-third of those names that he lists in his greeting in Romans chapter 16, the end of his letter, one-third are slaves' names. Paul, in his ministry, in his time in prison, Paul had met so many slaves, and he had preached to them, sharing God's word with them, winning them to Christ. And these people were not at all the leaders of Rome. They were the, the edge. They were the outcasts. They were the outskirts of the Roman Empire. But yet they became believers. And not just believers. They became workers. Not just workers, but vital sharers of this same amazing message of Jesus Christ. A message just like his birth that flourished in the margins. Even this date that we come to celebrate Jesus' birth, this was a date that was founded on the edge. I don't know if you know this or not, but Christmas, it's known that Christmas was first celebrated on January the 6th. In fact, to this day, there are lots of uh, Orthodox Christians that still celebrate Christmas on January the 6th. But around the second century, Christians who lived and worked mostly in Rome had, had to pick a time that they were going to celebrate Christ's birth. And so this, this, this date was decided that we now celebrate December 25th. And I, I, I wrote in my manuscript here, I wish there was a more holy and spiritual reason that they chose the date. All right, I wish there was a more a holy and spiritual reason that they chose the date, but there was, there was. So this date, December 25th, happened to be a Roman secular holiday. And it's probably a Roman secular holiday that many of you haven't heard of because the original holiday that stood in that place marker before didn't have a fraction of the power as the world-changing event that would take its place. December 25th was known by, by Rome. I'm going to say, and I, doggone it, Natalis Sol Invictus. Natalie's Sol Invictus, and it was a celebration of the planets and the, and the, the sun. Actually, literally, it was, a, it was a celebration of their son, God. It was a celebration of the birthday of their son, God. And so Christians chose that day because they already had, they already had the day off. And, and then they renamed it in Bethlehem, Judea. They renamed it, calling it Natalie's Christus, which is a celebration of the birth of Christ. Heather told me I shouldn't even share this, but this is actually pretty huge what the Christians did in the second century. This is like when Baker Mayfield, love him, love him in Oklahoma, hate him in Oklahoma, love him in Cleveland, hate him in Cleveland, however you feel about Baker Mayfield. This is like when Baker Mayfield took, ran out to the 50-yard line and planted a big Oklahoma Sooners flag right in the middle of Ohio State Stadium. This is huge. This is what the Christians were doing. Obviously, that, that ha doesn't even compare to what the Christians were doing. But they changed the celebration for this date. And the early Christians, they, they planted this symbolic flag for Christ on, the, on that date, the date that Rome was celebrating their son God, and instead they celebrated the birth of the son of God the birth of Christ. And this is huge, but the celebration that they would hold, the mass, the worship of the Christ child that they would, that they would hold, born in Bethlehem of Judea, Christ mass, or Christ mass, the day, the date that was born at the edge, the day, the date that was born in the margins of the Roman culture, but the day, the date, an event that was so important that it would stand for more than a 1,000 years afterwards and still counting. The wonder and the goodness of this holiday, what has happened to what it is that we're celebrating is that the birth of Jesus Christ is so good. And the birth of Jesus Christ is so true. It's so powerful that when we see this for ourselves, when we see that there's this big picture that's perfectly clear what happened on that day when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. When we're reminded of that, it makes all the difference. This holiday, this world-changing event, it, it shouldn't be an afterthought. Cr Christmas shouldn't be, the real meaning of Christmas shouldn't be a second thought. And this, the, all of this shouldn't fill the margins 
of our lives. This should not fill the margins of our schedules. It should be dead center. So remember the outskirts of Bethlehem. Remember the manger. Remember the place where for once in our lives, everything became a you, and it stopped being an it. It became flesh. It was the whole reason that Jesus became flesh. The whole reason that God came to earth, it was for you and for me. But for many, unfortunately, and I, I actually have in my manuscript uh, uh, unintentionally, but I, I got to say, there's no, there's no way we can pull the unintentional card here. But unfortunately for many of us, we, we miss out on the most important detail by giving so much effort to the, to the smallest details. Do you know that this is the, the exact same way that the Bible describes Jesus' second coming? In Matthew 24, verse 37 through 39, he writes these words. For just like the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and took them all away. It will be the same at the coming of the Son of Man. You see, the reason that the, the flood was and the reason that the second coming of Christ will be a surprise is because it's like Scripture says, no one was waiting no one will be waiting or watching. Literally, people were going through their day-to-day -day with no concern. They, were, they had no expectation of what was getting ready to happen on the earth with the flood. And that very same thing that was, tr was true that very first Christmas, people were going through their lives in Bethlehem, maybe caught up in the busyness of the census, and they were caught up in the busyness of trying to find some place for their own family to stay. No concern, no expectation of the amazing thing that was getting ready to happen on the earth, and not just on the earth, but right near them. Even though Joseph and Mary had some of their own family there in Bethlehem, there was no room for them in the end because no one was waiting, no one was expecting them. I don't, I don't know if you know about this or have heard about this or read about this yet, but uh, there is a, and I may be give, going a little over dramatic here, but there is a major universal phenomenon that's scheduled to happen tomorrow evening right after sunset. Of course, the day is a day that happens every year. It's called the winter solstice. It's the shortest daylight day of the year and the longest period of darkness of the whole year. Right after sundown, tomorrow evening, the planets Jupiter and Saturn, I don't know if this is where they belong or not, it just did the hand thing. They're, the planets Jupiter and Saturn will align in creating what a lot of people are calling a, a superstar. And even some people are going so far as to calling it a Christian or Christmas star. This is an event that happened last on March the 4th, 1226. And, and you know, I don't know what you think about all that. Some people may say this is just a coincidence, but you know what I love the most about this whole thought of this superstar or this Christmas star? Look, I, I don't know uh, what you think about the media today, and I, that's not an open question. I don't want to hear what you know about what you think about the media today. <laughs> You know, you may have come to, to love uh, news networks or hate news networks in this past year. I don't, I don't want to know about all that either. But you know what I love about this, this, this thought of this Christmas star? Is that everybody, everybody is talking about it. Everybody's going to be looking at it. And you know what? It may be just some natural, I don't believe this is true, but it may just be some natural, uh, universal thing that's going to happen, some occurrence, something that just happens in the stars. This, it may just be a margin. But if it brings celebration, and if it causes the world to focus, and it brings glory to God, then I say let's redeem it. And we take our big old flag and we plant this thing and we use it as a chance to talk about that first Christmas star and the reason that we all celebrate Christmas in the first place. God has always excelled in the outskirts. 
God has always excelled in the margins. So how about you? Have you left enough room in your margins? Have we allowed even margins to be had? Or, or have we filled up our schedule so full with everything that's going on with politics and COVID and family and even Christmas? This is such an oxymoronic thing to say that have we filled our, our schedules and our lives so full of even Christmas that we forget to leave room in the margins for what really happened that first Christmas in Bethlehem? Jesus, Emmanuel, God with skin on, God in the flesh, God who came down to be with us, our Savior, the Christ child, born in the margins of Bethlehem, not in the center of Bethlehem where Jesus belonged. You know, it wasn't just Mary and Joseph that began their journey with the Son of God born in a stable, laid in a manger because there was no room in the inn. That's exactly where, where we all start our own story. It's exactly where we start our own journey with Jesus. It's right where that begins to. And you know what? It's such an amazing story for all of us here today. And look, if this hasn't made sense to you before, if if the picture hasn't been clear to you before, if you haven't created room before, if, if, if the journey with Jesus hasn't started yet before, let let your journey start right here, right now. I found this song this week that I had never heard before, and I don't know how I missed it. I'm pretty keen on uh, Christian music stuff, and especially Christmas Christian music. But, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things that uh, once you hear it, you can't forget it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it kind of thing. But this song is a song that, Chris, uh, that uh, Casting Crowns and Matt Maher did together. And I felt that it was appropriate to share here today because it's called Make Room. And So I, let me just share a minute to read some of the lyrics for you. Family hiding from the storm. Found no place at the keeper's door. It was for this a child was born, to save a world so cold and hollow. The sleeping town they did not know, that lying in a manger low, a savior king who had no home, had come to heal our sorrows. Shepherds counting sheep in the night. Do not fear the glory light. You are precious in his sight. God has come to raise the lowly. Mother holds the promise tight. Every wrong will be made right. The road is straight and the burden's light, for in his hands he holds tomorrow. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are, but it's going to set you apart when you make room in your heart and you trade your dreams for his glory. You may have not ever heard this this man's name before, but you'll want to look him up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is his name. Kids, you want to Google him today too. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an amazing man. Dietrich Bonhoeffer began his ministry uh, in the 1920s, but he, uh, he, amazing man. And, and if you're a reader too, let me just step aside. If you're a reader too, you're going to want to look up some of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's books. Uh, he, Dietrich Bonhoeffer made an incredible impression uh, for, in the, in, for Christianity, and not just back in the 20s and 30s and, and the 40s, but uh, still yet today. But he, he wrote these words uh, that I think are so amazing for us to hear today. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, wrote these words, and this, these are the words he said. He, he's talking about Christmas, and he said, Who among us will celebrate Christmas correctly? Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. Whoever remains lowly and lets God alone be high. Whoever looks at the child in the manger and sees the glory of God precisely in his lowliness. And that is the wonder of all wonders, that God loves the lowly. God is not ashamed of the lowliness of human beings. In fact, God marches right in. He chooses people as his instruments. And he performs his wonders where one would least expect 
them to be performed. God is near to loneliness. He loves the lost. He loves the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak, and the broken. Jesus was born in the outskirts. He was born in the margins to let us know who also live in the margins that there's a place for us. There's a place for all of us. And so now in your life, now more than ever, make room for him. Make room for him, not just in the margins. You you can start in the margins, but don't stay in the margins. You and I need to make him the center of our lives. The center, not just of of our Christmas celebration, but he needs to be the center of our lives. And let me just say this too. I, it's not, this isn't just for us. It may, maybe this message is for you. But it, it may be a message for you to share with someone else. And you might, you might say, man, I don't feel equipped. I don't feel worthy. Remember what Paul said? He takes the foolishness of the world to shame the wise. He takes the weak of the world to shame the strong. Thank God for the foolish. Thank God for the foolish. Thank God for the margins. He he loved us so much in the margins so that we could go and share this light and shine this, the real Christmas star. We can shine this light and we can stand up for what we believe about Christmas. And we can stand up for what we believe about Jesus. Don't miss out on the most important detail of this whole season, of our whole lives. The baby born in a manger, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for even for what's ahead here, Lord, the children that are here to share this amazing message too. But Lord, be with us. Remind us that we're broken vessels. But but the broken vessels... The margins, the outskirts, the outcasts, that's exactly what you needed. That's exactly what you wanted. There was no mistake. There was no mistake in what happened that first Christmas in Bethlehem. There's no mistake in what's happening here this morning, Lord. Embolden us, empower us, the margins, to go out and share this amazing message of your son Jesus with others. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name.